from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you are weathering this pandemic in relative comfort and, of course, safety. And we look forward to greeting you back in our beautiful grill room on the shores of San Francisco Bay just as soon as conditions permit. Our speaker today is a fascinating person. Uh, he was born in Los Angeles and raised in Hollywood. Uh, he would get a bachelor's in science in biology from San Francisco State, my alma mater, and then go on to get a master's in science journalism from BU. He then went off to CMP Computer Media Publications, which was at the cutting edge of business journalism in the late 90s, as San Francisco's tech boom was taking off again. Um, our paths crossed there when uh, they awarded us uh, some awards for, among other things, the best new service provider as we launched the first DSL company in America. And then uh, he would go off to McGraw Hill and then to Red Herring, where our paths crossed again, as he named Yipes, a company I co-founded as best new startup in the year 2000 in San Francisco. Um, he would then go on to write two books, Panorama in 2015 on the centennial of the Pan Pacific Exposition. And that was an appropriate thing for him to be writing about because as it, as it turns out, his great grandfather, then uh, in his role as president of the San Francisco Merchant Exchange, was among a team of people from San Francisco that went after and won the Pan Pacific Exposition on the opening of the Panama Canal, beating out New Orleans and several other deserving cities to win that for San Francisco, which is a great civic accomplishment. And our speaker today also wrote Misfits, Merchants, and Mayhem in 2018, a terrific book if you haven't read it, all about the entrepreneurial uh, re-expression of spirit in San Francisco's waterfront during the early years of the uh, you know, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So that entrepreneurial spirit um, has been a part of San Francisco from the very, very, very beginning. And uh, to speak today about um, an incredible expression of that spirit, um, the San Francisco uh, port, our speaker will talk about San Francisco, port city stories of builders, scoundrels, and dreamers. So um, please welcome a journalist, an author, a historian, and a South End Rowing Club swimmer, our guest today, Lee Bruno. Lee, welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Really appreciate the opportunity to come back and um, and give you guys some more stories uh, from both books and some writings that I've done for the Argonaut, the San Francisco Historical Society's uh, journal. So the illustration was done after the fact in 1884, but it depicts uh, the the, your, the discovery of pre gold discovery of San Francisco and what it looked like. And so I think this is a great place to start. This is an engraving done by Edward Bosky, uh, perhaps the best lithographer in, in California during the 19th century. And it shows the first named streets, uh, Clay, Kearney, Montgomery, and Washington. And if you look closely up on the hill, you'll see these two arrows, one pointing to the right, which would take you to the Presidio, and the uh, left would take you to Mission Dolores. And so those are really um, extremely important uh, um, destinations um, at the time. Uh, and so we know that at this time, just before the fever hit uh, you know, and, and the gold, gold was discovered, we had roughly less than a thousand inhabitants and, um, and only 11 ships between this time would drop anchor, uh, nine of which was whalers and two were merchant ships. Um, and so you, in, in a matter of two years, you have uh, an explosion of, of, of human capital arriving by foreign ships, some 650 American foreign vessels, and some 90,000 passengers. And most, you know, just uh, mostly a lot of ships are abandoned in the, um, in the mudflats uh, and uh, crews head for the gold fields, as we know. Uh, 
I just think it's, it's um, this wonderful quote that was discovered later, you know, is with my readings and stuff is by the source uh, historian and author Marcus uh, Redeker, who wrote about um, 17th century. And he wrote this uh, great poignant perspective that I think is worth keeping in mind. From the decks of the ships, the wharves and the streets, the warehouses, the grog shops, the taverns, and public houses, the waterfront was a cultural context zone. These places constituted the material setting of a proletarian public sphere, the importance of which has rarely been recognized. It had its own means of communications and sailors were central to them. So, next slide here. This again, this is uh, looking a view from Telegraph Hill, um, looking down 18 April, 1850. Um, again, capturing that rugged town. Uh, so we get to our first uh, person I'd like to talk about is a Mifflin Wh uh, Worcester Gibbs. Uh, came to San Francisco and uh, actually was a co-owner of a boot and shoe store in San Francisco. Uh, and then um, in, in and around uh, 1855, he and a, um, and a couple others um, decided to, to start their uh, black owned newspaper. And um, one of the things that was really evident at the time was that California, despite being admitted to state in September 1850, um, there was a climate of racism and discrimination. And um, in April of that year, the state legislature had passed a law that denied white testimony in any cases where whites were involved. Testimony law stated no black or mulatto person or Indian shall be permitted to give evidence in favor of or against any white person. Every person who shall have one eighth part or more of Negro blood shall be deemed a mulatto and every person who shall have one half Indian blood shall be deemed an Indian. So this is, uh, you know, the, this, the spearhead for creating a black owned newspaper was inspired um, by Frederick Douglass who had, who had created the North uh, Star paper. And um, they had, these are the small enclave of African-American citizens living in San Francisco. Um, we're actually making um, some advancements in, in, in ownership of, of, of property and whatnot. Um, so I think it's an important kind of period uh, to sort of check and compare to uh, how Blacks were doing in other parts of, of the country. Uh, here, uh, it was a little bit more wide open despite course, the, the racism and whatnot. So they continue with the uh, the Mirror of the Times, the publication that they found in, in 1855. It lasts for a couple of years. And then um, Gibbs and his uh, co-owner um, just are, it's very, it's a, it's a struggle to deal with um, the kind of uh, um, institutional uh, issues of, of racism that are in the city, despite the fact that they have a, a strong sort of enclave and community and, and they pick up their bags and um, leave to British Columbia where they've been invited by the, the governor to come to, uh, to, the, to, to the province um, where there's a gold rush. So, um, and uh, the Pacific Appeal continues and then five subsequent publication, uh, black owned newspapers are part of San Francisco's rich cultural history. Um, Worth noting. Uh, here's here is a, a look at California Street uh, in 18, 18 about this that same time around 1855 and uh, Battery Street. So you can see this. Um, this is so the, we're this looking is down Battery Street, and uh, this is California Street Cross Street in the foreground, and to the right would be like what is now the Ferry Building. So this looks north up Battery. And to the right would be down California to the waterfront. And this, is, this was the name of where the, the enclave of the uh, African American community would be centered at that time. And we get to the you know the first story of uh, another significant pioneer is uh, George Davidson, who really was instrumental in, in pioneering uh, the uh, the charting of the um, of the Pacific Coast. Uh, up until the, the time that he undertakes this significant effort, um, uh, of course, uh, with the backing of the federal government, is 
he's he's producing these precise charts to avoid um, the kind of things that merchant ships um, did not want to do, and that is running uh, into uh, solid land or or reefs and rocks, and not understanding the the, the uh, topography of the uh, entrances to bays and whatnot. So his his work. Uh, created the publication of these charts detailing the entrances of the Colombian, Humboldt, San Francisco, and San Diego Bays, and the locations of Point Conception and Pinos in 1869. Davidson approached San Francisco Mayor uh, Frank McCoppin and the Board of Supervisors and offered to put San Francisco officially on the map, which he was, uh, of course, uniquely qualified to do. Um, he became the chief expedition uh, engineer, the chief engineer of the expedition. Um, to do this, and uh, it's it's uh, you know we benefit from all that uh, backbreaking work that he had to do um, at, on this coast survey work, uh, where he was camping on these isolated coastal promontories and mountaintops, and uh, you know his physical stamina is being tested um, through the weather and the circumstances of having to go ashore and some of these really really rugged inlets. Um, where nobody had really ventured before with the kinds of equipment that they needed to do to do the accuracy, uh, the, ac the accurate survey. Um, so these, so these charts are produced and um, this, thanks to his seminal work on the Pacific coastline, Davidson became known uh, as our legendary survey surveyor and cartographer and also quite a scientist um, in his own right. Um, this here is, is, uh, coastal map of San Francisco 1858. So again, as a result of his, of his work, and you can see um, some of the iconic uh, sort of elements here, uh, the finger piers and um, just beautiful, you know, works of art as well as accurate. So that's di the diagonal left or right on that picture, that diagonal, just for people to see, that's Market Street. Yeah, diagonal yeah. going from up left to down right. Uh, and and those are the piers um, uh, up at the top the top nub up there that would be Black Point the last word now Fort Mason is that kind of greenish nub right there is the last remaining piece of original San Francisco shoreline that's left and the big Mission Bay down the lower part of this image that's all filled in now of course that's all solid land there's a development down there now big biotech development so this is a fascinating by 1858 montgomery street cove all that's filled in so um this is yeah, the evolution of the waterfront is it's just it's quite remarkable san francisco's waterfront and you, and you can see the mission you know the the, the creek coming down into uh, mission bay which is significant you know, uh, at Mission Creek, that goes up to Mission Dolores, right? Amazing, wonderful, great shot, mate. So, the, uh, alongside of you know, because we're such a, an important port, and uh, merchants are uh, merchant vessels are coming in all the time. One of the uh, big, you know, big jobs of the time was just uh, water taxis, um, and the Crowley brothers were which uh, started their business with the purchase of a of a $80 rowboat, you know, basically a Whitehall, um, which got its name from uh, from from Whitehall in, in New York. These were known as the bicycles of the seas. And they used to ferry good services and sailors on and off. And, and they also, uh, you know, would equip them with, with sails, um, something that was, um, quite common in 1892 at the age of 17, the Crowley had purchased his 18 foot boat uh, for $80 and began the water taxi service, delivering supplies and passengers. Um, as, as would be imagined, uh, you know, in five years, he moved on to gas uh, powered uh, boats and launches because, you know, following the tides and having to hook on to the back of ships leaving, uh, it made it a little bit challenging, but you had to be there first, and uh, um, their their business continued, and the and the Crowley family um, diversified into a um, large mar global maritime uh, company, and also the existing Red and White fleet is still here in the bay operating. It's just a wonderful captures so much of what we would you know if we could time travel, we 
this puts us right there on the waterfront um, and 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 uh, and what that's like. I think the uh, the one little story that I love about this too is that these um, at the time these white halls uh, uh, were used to you know so extensively um, that um, the, and 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 at a time when there was a, a an outbreak of yellow fever, 1878, it hit the southeastern United States and um, the Shanghai crimps of all people, the people that were uh, gathering up, um, you know, um, un 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 uh, uh, sort of like the uh, the sailors that didn't really want to become sailors uh, by beating and knocking them over the head. These same people who had kidnapped people with service sailors decided to organize a boat race to raise money to benefit the people stricken with uh, yellow fever. And these were um, these were families of of of, of people that were merchants, uh, sa sailors, and whatnot. And these Whitehall races became popular. Um, and uh, you would they would basically take off in a light September breeze from the Vallejo Street Pier head out to Sausalito and then to Fort Point and back to the starting point. About $400 or what would be equivalent to $10,000 in today's currency was raised. And the success of the event led to the formation of the Whitehall Boat Club, which for the next decade organized the same race every July 4th. Um, and Tom Crowley was uh, a regular entrant and won many of these uh, 10 mile races. So <laughs> there we go. Every time I think about the bizarre process of racing sailboats, we all have to laugh, especially those of us who've raced thousands of races. It's always been um, a mystery why any of us want to go race obsolete forms of transportation, which is what sailboats are. Exactly. Um, so we take, I, I, there's another, uh, another set of pioneers that I think is a significant story for the waterfront. Um, these two ambitious businessmen, George Sweeney and Theodore Boat, on September 30th, 1853, um, actually are launched their very first uh, revolutionary machine in a 250 foot high wooden boat lookout perched on Point Lobos. And this was the vantage point to see incoming ships. Um, before this, uh, this this uh, lookout was created, and a telegraph line was run from here to the merch from there to the Merchants Exchange in downtown San Francisco. Um, people by would spot the the vessels, and then then um, then get on a horse and ride into town to tell of the vessel that was coming to the pier because it's a it's a big event when a new ship came into uh, the port. So this is again um, an important. You know, this is the the merchant exchange was seven miles away, and people were waiting to know what goods were coming. And by the, uh, of course, uh, whether it's a, a steam board, uh, a, a steam a steamboat or um, a three masted uh, full ship, um, lots of things can be deciphered just from the from the vessel by its outward uh, appearance. Um, so. These, you know, these these guys were quite entrepreneurial, and they created something that was quite novel for the time, and uh, and it made a big difference. And to this day, when you walk out to Point Lobos, you can actually get a great feeling for you know how far out you can see from that. Uh, tell people where Point Lobos is. You mean out on the yes. San Francisco? Yes. So you're out near um, you're out near Lands End. That's where like, like Geary and like. Where uh, gear ends up, kind of where the cliff house would be. Right. You, you just be, veer right and take the trail um, where Fort Miley is, and you go on the on the trail, and it actually goes right past the very location where this was uh, located. Is this an illustration we're looking at? A drawing? Yeah. This is a, but this is this is an illustration that's uh, showing Telegraph Hill, and this is where uh, through a series of semaphore flags that was how the information was was uh, transmitted as well. So there was very prom various promontory spots in San Francisco in this seven mile reach to get to downtown where uh, the, the semaphore would signal would reach um, to, um, would reach uh, Telegraph Hill, which then uh, people would be really excited and also, you know, 
from prostitutes to butch butchers and and whatnot. Everybody wanted to know when there was an incoming ship because it made a chance <laughs> to make money and exploit uh, un, uh, unwitting uh, newcomers to their shores. So another um, great entrepreneur and, and significant San Franciscan was Irving Scott, who was, uh, this is uh, his, this was considered Happy Valley at Mission and First Street. And there's a wonderful shot of, a, of, a, of a, you know, the ironworks. And uh, in 1865, um, he, uh, Irving, Irving Scott purchased from Peter Donahue, who was a failed gold prospector and uh, his, uh, an iron foundry pioneer. He sold his Union Iron Works and, his, um, and he had been an apprentice that had worked for Scott. Um, and he, he bought, bought it with the idea that, uh, you know, that he would be able to create machinery that would be used um, in the silver uh, mining and the Comstock load in Nevada. Um, but he, you know, he, he actually was very forward thinking because he knew that, uh, the silver, uh, the silver Comstock load would uh, would 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 vanish over a period of time. So he recognized that uh, sh building locomotives and ships were something that he could do. Um, and his he converted and grew his shipyard, uh, which is roughly at the waterfront area of Pier 70, into one of the most versatile ironworks in the country uh, in 1885. The plant built the first steel-hulled ship in the Pacific Rim in 1880, 1890s. The USS San Francisco and the steel-protected Navy cruiser that defended American coasts from German submarines in World War I. Um, and the battleship, U.S. battleship Oregon was built right there at, at Union Ironworks. And it was just, um, these crowds would uh, always appear, great crowds would appear when the Oregon came into port because it was such a sense of pride uh, of, of San Francisco having having built the ship, um, he was uh, he was a great philanthropist and and uh, he loved the arts and he supported those and he was also a member of the Mechanics Institute um, and part of the leadership team there. Um, he's another important person. So you know the the birth of San Francisco's fishing industry is another wonderful story about. Italian immigrants who really pioneered um, fishing with these, as you can see in the left of Felucca, uh, under full sail, um, beautiful boats, most which, which were built here in San Francisco on the coastline. And uh, just, uh, they would take them out for two or three days at a time and um, going off as far as the uh, Farallons and whatnot, um, and then fishing also inside the bay with nets. Um, rugged, durable, um, capable fishermen. Um, among them, who was one of the pioneers of Achille Palladini, who had come from San Francisco, uh, come from Italy in San Francisco in 1865. And he, uh, he jumped ship basically, uh, left his merchant ship and realized that this was a good, good place uh, with only a couple of dollars in his pocket, like a lot of immigrants. And he worked hard and and built a, an amazing uh, business of, of uh, fishing industry. And it really helped sort of establish the, the fishing industry with his, uh, from just starting as a, with a small boat. And Fisherman's Wharf, do we know where we're looking at there? Is that? Yeah, so this is, this is yeah, this is, uh, the, the photo on the right is, is Fisherman's Wharf. And these are the Felucas, which are lined up, which is, you know, and you can see the, the mass of the tall ships as well that are there. Um, but anyway, he, he um, Palladini made a, made a fortune. And in 1906, the earthquake wiped out his real estate fund. Uh, his, um, his, his, uh, his you know, most of his money is lost because it was an insured property. And then he uh, rebounded. And by 19, 1910, he's back up and uh, created such a, an amazing, uh, business along with others uh, on the water for the other Italians that uh, they, they became kind of uh, investigated by the uh, by the state of California for uh, monopolistic practices. <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, to this day, we still have, you know, we, we can enjoy the waterfront and see the Italian vestiges of which really were uh, at the very forefront of, of creating an industry that uh, we could be very proud of. Um, so 1906 earthquake was, of course, the one moment that we uh, celebrate every year. And uh, I, I think one of the stories, we, we, we know a lot about the, uh, the fire that destroyed the city, but um, this picture on the right is um, down at Carmel by the sea and it's uh, George Sterling. And, um, and you can see in the center of the picture is Jack London. And this is where they, uh, where Jack London retreated along with uh, uh, Arnold Genthy, who was a great photographer and had photographed uh, some of the most iconic images of, of the fire uh, and its aftermath in San Francisco. Uh, but this is where they retreated to this, uh, this basically this Bohemian enclave that had been started, Carmel by the Sea. And, um, and that's where he developed his film and, and, uh, and mingled among the, the artists uh, of, of the day. Uh, but again, these photographs are, like I said, they're quite, uh, quite breathtaking um, just because he's, he's so, such a remarkable photographer. But so on the left, that picture, that's Alcatraz out there. We're looking yes, at that's Alcatraz, yeah. Fire. So this is 1906. Shortly after the fire, yeah. And one of the things that's uh, really remarkable about Genthi is, you know, again, his, he had all of his photo photography equipment in his, um, in his, in his apartment. Um, the, 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 the earthquake destroyed it. It was condemned that he couldn't go into the building. He convinced the guard there that he you know, to go in by offering him a bottle of wine um, or liquor of some kind. And um, he goes in and finds all of his equipment smashed and destroyed. So he ventures down to Montgomery Street where the fire is encroaching upon and goes into a camera shop there. And the owner, he, he asks the owner if he can purchase a, a camera and there's a Kodak, uh, small Kodak sort of portable camera that's like not as boxy and consuming with uh, plates and, and whatnot stands that were part of the photography of the day. Uh, he, the guy says, just take the camera and whatever because I'm gonna lose my store. So packs his, packs his jacket his, uh, and has his khaki pants on and, and for the next, uh, Couple of days, he just tours the, the the city that's being devastated by the fire and takes photographs. So, um, and each year, you know, in April, we celebrate, you know, the anniversary of the fire with uh, right. exhibits of, of some of these uh, images. And Genthi is like right there. Um, Anna Colbreth, who's quite California's first po poet laureate, she made an indelible mark on the lives of many famous writers and helped transform the landscape of literature and poetry in California. Um, she was, uh, she was, you know, in, she became the first uh, female librarian in the U.S. Uh, for what became the Oakland uh, Free Library in 1874. And um, one of the persons that, you know, she recommended uh, books to was a scrappy young child, uh, young boy named Jack Lennon, who was really, didn't have a library card. Uh, brought a stack of books into back to the, which was not really something you were supposed to do. She kind of looked the other way. And um, the two, she was able to, to mentor and, and give this very hungry, poor, poor kid uh, a reading list that was uh, quite remarkable um, and helped him grow into uh, um, a, a much, you know, a, one, of, one of our great California writers. Um, she also, uh, Ina Kroberth also uh, knew Isidore Duncan and, uh, but in the great fire earthquake of 1906, her fire destroyed her home and all of her books and her nearly compute, uh, complete manuscript on the history of California's early literary scene. So we lose some wonderful things, but uh, Ina Kroberth is a, a, again, a, a quite a remarkable pioneer that I talk about in Misfits. Where is that picture? What where what library is that? So that is from what that is the Oak uh, that that is the uh, that is the Oakland Free Library. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, this is a name that not a lot of people would know. Is Harris DeHaven Connick? Um, he was the engineer in San Francisco who um, was really responsible for the the Pan Pacific Exposition Fair being in the uh, 
Harbor, Harborside, known at the time, which was now the Marina District, uh, the last vestige of the remaining vestige that everybody knows about is the Palace of Fine Arts from the uh, Pan Pacific Exposition of 1915. Um, but you know, when ship captains were entering San Francisco Bay in uh, April of 1912, they could see the exposition grounds taking shape. And here you can see, you know, there's a lot of fill that has to happen here because um, it's mostly marshy. And you can see uh, this washerwoman's lagoon, I think, is right there in the, uh, in the picture on the left. And the other one showing the horses and, and uh, you know, uh, the work that's involved heavy work that was done involved in creating this um, the landfill that was possible to build the fair on top of them now. So, so the St. Francis Yacht Club in the picture on the left yes. would be in the upper left corner of the shoreline there, it seems to me. Yes. Looking at this, right. exactly. That looks like Baker Street going down right there. And then this big lagoon where the Marina District now is, you can see that uh, Marina Boulevard would be at the north end of this picture. Uh, yeah, and this is yeah. like about seven acres that's filled, you know, that's, uh -huh. that's, a, that's a lot of acreage to fill. I, you know, you, you would not stand a chance of filling any bay lands uh, because of, you know, we do the ecology around it, but to reverse it is, uh, would be pretty unlikely, I would think, today. Originally, when you see photographs of the first shovel that Taft takes of for starting the fair, it's done in Golden Gate Park, and every you know you got to scratch your head like, well, what's that? Why is that? Well, 1894 Midwinter Fair was in Golden Gate Park, and um, there was a strong contingent, um, and De Young was one of the ones that was part of that strong contingent. His newspaper was trying to convince uh, San Francisco that we should have the fair in the Golden Gate Park. Uh, there was uh, John McLaren, sort of the great uh, green thumb of of Golden Gate Park sort of stood in the way along with others. And really what, what tipped the balance was that because there were so many building supplies that were gonna to have to be moved uh, physically, the logistics of moving all that to build that in the, um, in, in the Golden Gate Park area made it really economically extremely expensive. So Harborside became the site for the, after a pretty fierce battle you know, in, in the city with of course, you know, on both sides, people are going to win money on land speculation, probably uh, either way. But uh, I think it's good that Golden Gate Park did not get chosen, because uh, we it probably would have been a lot different looking than it is today. Um, Fremont Older is another uh, quite amazing pioneer. Um, he had uh, come to San Francisco and, and um, as as a, as a young man and his his goal was really to become a newspaper man. Um, he'd grown up in a Wisconsin farm. He was inspired by the story of Horace Gre uh, Greeley, the founder and editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Um, and he came here as like a 17 year old uh, in pursuit of a job becoming a newspaper editor and made his way uh, to, uh, to various newspapers and ends up at the, at the Bulletin uh, in 1895. And one of his, uh, you know, this is the, he also is, a, is an important part of the, um, the small group that uh, is, is bands together to fight the, corrupt, the graft and corruption of Abe Roof and uh, Mayor Schmitz at the time. Um, so this picture on the left is, shows um, Francis, uh, Francis Henry, uh, Rudolf Spreckles, and of course, uh, Older, who's in uh, Fremont Older, who's in the center of the picture. Um, the other thing that's remarkable about his 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 life and what he did is that um, in uh, in about 1913, um, the Red Light Abatement Act came about, and um, it ended up shutting down a lot of the Barbary Coast and and the Red Light District of San Francisco, which had been um, allowed for all those years, but what happened is there was an anti-prostitution crusade that was running across the country, and there was a, 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 a an effort to to make cities more livable for middle class homes and uh, middle class families and whatnot. Um, so, a Reverend Paul Smith, who is the Reverend at the Central Methodist Church, made it his cause to 
really try to shut down prostitution. So on January 25th, 1917, some 300 female prostitutes marched to this to his Central Methodist Church at O'Fair on Leavenworth Streets to protest this anti-prostitution crusade. Uh, it was led by two Adam, uh, madams, uh, one of which Reggie Gamble was you know, sort of the, the, the speaker. And um, it had been really, uh, it had really been because of older, uh, Fremont Older that uh, Gamble and these women really organized because part of what he did when he was at the Bulletin is he um, came across, uh, was, was approached with a uh, sort of a, a manuscript, if you will, of uh, what it was like, the life of a, of, of a of prostitution um, and published that in a series uh, in the paper, which was extremely well read um, well, at the time. Uh, but he, he met Gamble and Gamble uh, and this, this idea of like protesting against um, Reverend Paul Smith um, was, was form of uh, sort of, you know, a, 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 something that he helped sort of architect with, uh, um, with Gamble. Um, but she spoke and she basically said, you don't want women such as us around your church, do you, Gamble continued. You want to keep your church clean. You don't do anything to stop vice by driving us women out of the city to come to some other city. Has our, has your city and your church a different God that you drive evil away from your city and your church to other cities and other churches? Um, and she said to Smith, what would, what would become of the hundreds of thousands of women who took up prostitution only because they could not make a decent living any other way? As a, as a result, I don't know, you know, if there's, if the protest really changed anything, but um, it was another, another important sort of civic act. I think if you can think of San Francisco's culture and, and some of the uh, trials and tribulations that we've been through, I think uh, it's, it is one of those cornerstones of, uh, to marvel at. So it's also interesting that photo, go back to that photo, that O'Farrell and Livingworth Street is in fact the tenderloin right now. Yeah. So I'm not sure the profession has moved on very far. No, <laughs> there is still the, the, that vestige. Um, yeah, and it's like when you read, you know, the accounts and you and you read um, some of the, the material, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a very rough, well, of course, it's a rough business, but these women, you can see they're dressed in furs and whatnot, and so they're, um, I have something here, the, you know, the, the, the Smith sort of, the besieged Smith asked the women if $10 a week wage or $187 today would be sufficient to get them to quit prostitution, they replied, they'd need 20 to $25, and Smith responded that the figure was unrealistic. When he asked, uh, when he asked how many would be willing to do housework, one woman answered, what, what woman wants to do, wants to work in a kitchen, at which the gathering laughed. Um, <laughs> again, um, so, we just, so we go back to 1915, and these, these three iconic uh, American uh, inventors and entrepreneurs are uh, gathered here, where we have uh, Thomas Edison, um, Luther Burbank, and Henry Ford. And, and remarkable at the time, it's like the one person that's really uh, quite the rock star of the era is, 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 uh, is Luther Burbank. Um, and these three inventors, um, they're sitting up in Santa Rosa. Um, and what happened is each of the men had been honored at the, at the Pan Pacific Exposition in 1915 uh, for their work and their contributions to, uh, um, to the um, improvement of life in America, um, the standard living. So um, basically, because Ford and, and Edison are so fascinated with Burbank and what he's done, um, they ask, Can, you know, we'd like to see your, your, your working gardens and what. So they take a train, leave the city, and go up to, uh, um, to Santa Rosa to visit. And, uh, and there, you know, they are sort of basically kind of like just asking this, this wizard of horticulture who developed more than 800 plant species and varieties, including the Santa Rosa plum, Shasta daisy, the fire poppy. Um, they just, they're just fascinated by what uh, Burbank has done. 
Um, and, um, and there's an, an entourage there, you know, around Burbank's house, his, his little greenhouse. And uh, the kids outside um, start, um, you know, they, they uh, you know, I think he's, you know, like I said, he's sort of a celebrity status, but it was, it was an event to have these, these, uh, these men there. Um, and they're, and, and they're saying, they're singing uh, these school children that assembled outside, I love you, California. Um, so then he, Burbank has the children come inside the yard and suggest the guests go upstairs and wave to them from the balcony. Um, but the whole affair is like, sort of shows the, um, the richness of, of the, um, of what is going on at the fair as well. Some people have said that if you <laughs> were, take the, were to take the 1915 exposition and sort of um, put a big bubble around it, you could sort of, you would have all of, you'd need for civilization uh, because everything was, was there in some form. Um, and one of those great moments of San Francisco uh, history at, at the Pampas Week's Fair is like when you ask, well, what, what makes the, the World's Fair at San Francisco in 1915 unique? And it really is aviation. For all of you that are um, well, very familiar with uh, the plaque, the Lincoln Beachy plaque, uh, that still is on the wall close to the uh, St. Francis Yacht Club and, and, and the beach there. Um, um, Beachy was, um, was an amazing um, aviation, you know, aviator. And unfortunately, um, he, he, he died in, in a crash uh, at the fair, um, flying his mono, monoplane, uh, which he had been warned about that was, um, he, he, did, he did a loop-to-loop -loop and basically they, the <coughs> supporting strut that um, snapped and uh, crashed into the bay and, and uh, was unable to free himself from the tangled. Um, Is that him falling? Is that that and, image you're saying? That's the, that, that is a photograph. Just amazing, like that photograph in 1915, to get that, <laughs> to capture that, and to see how those wings had just sort of just absolutely kind of sheared and collapsed. There's um, two ships that are right there. I don't recall that there were docks uh, on the north well, edge of the Pan Yeah, they weren't. These were, these were out in, in the bay, and I think they were there because of the Pan Pacific Exposition. So, um, so they were able to get divers out there pretty quickly. He was in about 30, uh, probably more than 30 feet of water, but uh, yeah, he just wasn't able to free himself. So he actually drowned. He just, he broke a leg on the, on the crash. It, and it was just so, um, it put such a dark, um, um, you know, kind of gloom over San Francisco that, uh, you know, they'd lost a, a kid that basically had grown up in the, in the uh, Fillmore district and um, was, was this, you know, he started out in ballooning and, and worked in a bicycle shop and uh, just kept pursuing it. And was, it was one of, he was really a barnstormer of, of that era and fearless. And the picture, it's showing him flying through the, uh, the, um, uh, the Palace of Machinery, which was the largest wooden structure uh, I think ever assembled in that, in that day and era. But these, these are the stunts that just were natural. He'd do this loop-to-loop -loop maneuver that was, quite um so the caption uh, says that he's falling into the bay off the fort mason transport docks great photographs you've got this very dramatic so just to finish out the the little the little inset photograph is is another young aviator that came from chicago art smith and after beachy had died um the fair invited art smith to come to san francisco and if you see some of the pictures of the fair and also in the book you'll see these amazing um, photographs of when Art Smith puts flares on the ends of his canvas winged uh, plane, flies it through the air and creates these beautiful sort of um, lasting, uh, sort of almost, it's almost like sky writing with, with the, the photographs that are taken. But again, Art Smith was, um, he, he could not replace Beachy, but he did an amazing uh, job at uh, becoming the, the sensational uh, daredevil pilot for uh, the fair uh, after the passing of Vici. And that, that pretty much finishes up uh, my, uh, my talk. And so thank you for uh, your attention and, and interest. Uh, Terrific. Yeah. Uh, what, a, what a fun presentation. Um,
So a few questions. Those original black people, you, your statistics show that 2% of the population, like in 1850, is black. Uh, right. Just a few, very few folks. And those people were ex-slaves who somehow got their freedom and came west. Those yeah. must be very enterprising people. Yeah, so some are, some, some are fleeing, yeah, they're, um, some are fleeing slavery and, um, and there's a very famous um, case, the Archie Lee, that is a, um, he's a, he's a slave that comes to the state and the, and the, and the question is if, if, San, if California is a free state, um, you know, this issue of like, what, what does it do about uh, a slave that's, that's come there that is owned? Um, it is, it goes to the Supreme Court and, and I think uh, the outcome is basically that Archie Lee has to go back to his slave uh, owner. Um, so you do have a mix like of, of, of people that have been, um, so for example, Mr. Uh, the, the one that I speak about, Gibbs, Gibbs uh, had, father was a minister, he never was uh, enslaved and um, had a very different trajectory but experiencing the same um you know, all the same issues of racism around him that uh, just was so detestable that he decided to leave san francisco with his family um but yeah so you do have like your question just to answer your question is yeah you have a mix of of of, uh, of slaves and then freed slaves that have arrived in california and uh are actually um you know of at that time frederick Douglass was pretty impressed with um, that, well, that which was going on in Northern California. And like, if, if you think of California, California was mostly about Northern California. Uh, that's where the center of most of the commerce and um, activity. And uh, I think it was a, considered to be a reasonable destination for blacks. Okay, the first business is in San Francisco. Given that there was nobody here, uh, as the square workers started arriving, and given that most people who came to California intended to go up to the gold mines and head up to uh, Sacramento area, San Francisco was really sort of a hopping off spot. It was kind of like a bouncing spot. And thus the first businesses uh, originally were uh, bars and hotels and um, uh, basically uh, restaurants for transients that were gonna keep moving to go to Sacramento. Can you talk a little bit about that initial spirit of business in San Francisco. Yeah, so I, I so I, I think that's you know it, it is kind of interesting that you know the the ships that become abandoned become then scavenged and then used as for chandleries and for uh, stores of different kinds and so people are uh, there's no there's no real lumber industry on the West Coast and and until later uh, as a result of of. Uh, some entrepreneurial efforts. Um, so, so yeah, these these ships become uh, stores, and and uh, and as they said, you know, the the way uh, people that went into the gold fields were, didn't really make fortunes. It was the people that sold them the picks and shovels and the and uh, and other services that they needed um, that were the ones that really made out in in, in most of the gold in most of the gold rushes uh, here and and uh, also. Uh, to, to our north in Alaska. So what's your source? Give us a, a kind of like a day in the life of Lee. When you're interested in researching, you you have such great maps and photographs. Where, where are your sources for research? Where do you go hang out? So uh, it's always a good question, but it's funny how um, now, like when I did the pan, when I did the book on the Pan Pacific Exposition, I went to the California Historical Society and I started with the letters and my uh, you know, letters and speeches of my great grandfather R.B. Hale. Um, so that became kind of like the, the sort of like the the nugget of like material that I really want to get into. And as a consequence, then you you start asking other questions about things. So then I'm at the Mechanics Institute where I spend a lot of time digging through um, their their they have a you know as a library they've got a lot of great books, um, but the photography and whatnot, and also the newspaper collections are, you know, the California digital, uh, online digital uh, archive is amazing. Like you can, you can go in and search newspapers and newspapers are just filled with um, 
so much interesting context, you know, and of course you had to double check your facts against what's being reported at the time, but um, that becomes a really an inspiration for digging into more materials. But you sort of start triangulating, I think, you know, do you, uh, I mean, as a, I'm, I don't consider myself like a classic historian like that, always in, you know, primary sources, but you really do want to try to get as close to primary sources as you can. But I'm reading a lot of secondary sources and I'm going to newspapers and then it's like, of course, letters are, are great. Um, and the photographs come from, you know, a variety of places. A, a lot of the San Francisco Public Library's uh, historical archive is online. And it's just, it's amazing, like what you can find in there. And then you have the Library of Congress, you can dial into that very easily online and look at the images and search against them and find great stuff. And then, of course, the Bancroft. The Bancroft is, you know, the institution that we should really just be very proud of to have all the collections that they do, and they just do an amazing job. So it's it's kind of a mix of various kinds of places and and uh, and, and you know libraries. So your title is so fascinating. Uh, you said uh, stories of builders, scoundrels, and dreamers. Tell us about a builder, one that you might not have mentioned yet, but a builder who was an interesting early San Francisco. And then I'm going to ask you about a scoundrel and a dreamer as well, an <laughs> exemplary builder. Okay. So, so a builder, you know, I didn't mention him in this talk, but, you know, uh, Meg's is, uh, Meg's Wharf is, is, you know, quite an uh, entrepreneurial uh, undertaking. And, and um, you know, it's not everybody that would, uh, you know, take their shot at bringing a load of lumber all the way around on a schooner uh, and then selling it for quite a quite a um, margin uh, to the hungry you know city of San Francisco that needs lumber because they, they you know they have fires and there's not a lot of, there's not a real lumber industry in place but um, so Megs is like I would, cons I would put him right there in the builder category of, of early pioneer San Franciscans that is really quite Quite interesting because then he he's creating Meg's Wharf um, and it becomes of course a real estate scandal because he's absconds with money from the from the city coffers um, to to help ride out uh, this, all the real estate speculation then leaves leaves the city uh, for South America where he builds railroads. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I don't want to say that he summarizes both uh, all of uh, builders, scoundrels, and dreamers. But give us now a, a scoundrel story, San, an early San Francisco scoundrel story. But you can't use Meg's. He's, no, already, he's no. already been used mm -hmm. as a builder. You used him up in a builder story. I think the scoundrel story that you you can't help but love is uh, about uh, Abe Roof and and Mayor Schmitz. It's like they uh, they take graft to a whole nother level, and it's like and there's like so many wealthy people that are that are involved in it that it's 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 like the tentacles reach everywhere and um uh, that's it's it's amazing to see like you know Fremont older and um and then the the, the team that's sort of assembled uh, and Spreckles of course is one of those people that's unusual because he's he's of that very elite wealthy class but he's willing to to take it on and and actually help finance this uh, effort because that's basically what uh, is is asked by by um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. He says, "Look, we're not going to carry the, the the boatload of money here. You're going to need some. We need some money coming out of San Francisco to do this investigation." So, you know, so there's a certain amount of heroism and and also the the the, the graft of of these guys. Uh, are just it's it's. So what? But what was the nub of the scandal? What what did they do? So it, when it comes to um, the graft, they're getting kickbacks all kinds of kickbacks all the time for everything. Um, and whether it's, you know. What was their, e what era? Is this the era of the Pacific 1915? This is, no, this is way before that. So th these two guys have orchestrated, you know, quite um, quite an undertaking that, you know, have, has enriched them and then a lot of people around them. Uh, in fact, Abe Roof, I mean, I think if you look at the building that uh, Coppola, uh, owns that's all of uh, a lot of the money that Abe Roof has made from his from his kickbacks and all of his uh, graft. Um, so those two, and then and then on the other side you have, you know, you have Fremont Older, who's like this pioneering um, newspaper man that just like he 
he uh, he's part of the team along with Spreckles, who's you know an elite, um, wealthy, you know, part of the you know the sugar kings of San Francisco, and he's willing to go head to head with um, this corruption um, because without that uh, Spreckles money, I don't know if the graft uh, investigation and the hiring of Francis Haney would have would have happened uh, because Roosevelt did want to see um, some money coming out of San Francisco to help underwrite this uh, prosecutorial efforts because uh, it's quite significant. But that's a that's a big chapter, you know, in, in San Francisco history. Um, what was it when you said the sugar kings? What was the sugar king? Well, I'm saying that, you know, the Spreckles are, you know, they, they, uh, they had created, a, you know, an empire of, 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 with the sugar trade and so of course this is the hawaii back and forth knuckles yes exactly from the west coast to hawaii because they had sugar cane growing in hawaii yeah. and then that that great that the money from from adolph spreckles you know uh was left to big alma and big alma uses part of that money to to build the the um the legion of honor and she had gone to the pan pacific exposition seen the mock-up, you know, sort of the, it was like an actual building that was, that was made to look like the Legion of Honor in, 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 in France, in Paris. And so she's inspired by this and seeing all this wonderful art. She says she, uh, she decides that's how she's going to spend part of her fortune is creating this uh, Legion of Honor, which is, you know, to, to this day, you know, it's uh, something that all San Franciscans and evil, and any visitors and uh, tourists, you know, um, uh, from out, way outside of the area can enjoy, you know, that uh, amazing museum and the road end sculptures that she brought, um, you know, those, those things wouldn't be here, you know, and so, um, so yes, and there's sort of this tangled web of, you know, of, uh, of interest that sort of is also sort of enriches San Francisco's history and stories and, um, and, um, and, and, you know, and the people that are at the, at the center of it. Wonderful. Well, Lee Bruno, journalist, author, historian, and South End Rowing Club swimmer, it's been uh, really a pleasure to uh, hear your story about San Francisco's, you know, builders, scoundrels, and early dreamers. Uh, it's always fun. Each of our visits with you uh, is very popular, and uh, we get lots out of it. Uh, keep writing books and come back and tell us more about uh, San Francisco's heritage because you're a great storyteller. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you as a guest of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Yeah, well, thank you, Ron. As, as always, always welcome to, always glad to come back. And this is, uh, this is a treat, so thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Mm -hmm.